This conference will now be recorded. Thanks for joining us today uh, for the discussion on the increasing regulation of speech. This is an area that has always fascinated me to look at the issues that come with freedom of speech. There's always good and bad uh, to different things in different situations. And so we wanted to go through a, a few of those today to discuss. There's definitely an increased push in society to regulate speech, but uh, we've been regulating it for quite some time. And I think it's really good to understand what types of regulations exist and what impacts that has on our society as a whole. So to start out, I just always like to say the purpose for this is to help us become more able to uh, articulate our own beliefs and to align our actions um, more closely with those. I believe that we have a heritage of freedom that gives us a responsibility to work hard to preserve freedom and to support uh, those principles, principles that will help America stay on a good path. I do believe that freedom means there's a proper balance of law and uh, individual rights. And then if that balance goes off, then we head um, in directions that aren't the best for us. Oops. So for the discussion, we do ask, again, we really like to have people share things that they believe or disagree on, um, that we avoid using labels or passing judgments, and that we focus on the issues. There's a lot, a lot of tangents to go off of and hopefully we can stay close to the ones for this discussion. And then again, if you have things you'd like to talk about later, just let me know and we'd be, it'd be great to include those in a future discussion. So today we're gonna to talk, um, of course, about speech. And so the law, I say that one of the constitutional provisions that I'd, I'd guess most of Americans are familiar with, or the, if you had any constitutional provision, I think this one would be the most well-known. And then it says that Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of speech. So the questions that we want to discuss today, and here are some initial thoughts on if you have it, are, is there speech that is a society or is it, or as, as individuals that we do not want to allow? And then the follow-up question of when is it proper to ban speech? Um, and just, you know, to... To be clear, the courts have recognized many situations where it's proper to ban speech. And so it's a, it's not a matter of you know, if we ban speech, but more when we ban it and when it's appropriate to do so, despite what the First Amendment says. Uh, so just curious to hear your thoughts on types of speech that um, you've either heard people don't want to allow or you personally think shouldn't be allowed. I uh, just wanted to open up the discussion there. I know that like, um, can't, I think speech that would could be considered treasonous, I think is banned. And I know, I mean, also obviously, I think the most common example is certain swear words is, are banned on um you know on tv i know like at the mines we use um radios that you, you use federal federally regulated airwaves and you're not you're not supposed to swear at all over the radio um i'm and because it's it's a publicly publicly available frequency in that and we, we're not supposed to do anything like that when we're talking on the radio. Um, it, I, I guess I'd have to think of a way to justify this to the world, but I would love to ban things like pornography. I think that freedom of speech is often used to justify things like that, but that's what I've got. Yeah, thanks for that. And just as a funny uh, joke I heard once, when the radio came out and the government started licensing airwaves, they started selling licenses to certain bandwidths in the air. And the joke was that the government was the only entity actually smart enough to figure out how to make money out of thin air. 
So, uh, but yes. Yeah. <laughs> the mines, the mines have to pay for their license to use those radios. <laughs> yeah, and every every radio station's paying for those licenses. So it's uh but but on the speech thing, yeah, the there are you know the waves, what goes over them is regulated. Primetime television, technically, even though it's gotten really bad, they still have some restrictions on what they can't air during that time. Um, and for years in America, there was a lot of restrictions on what could or couldn't be said, and and so that was a that was a big deal. Still is a big deal. Radio, I think, still has some level of restriction to it on what can or can't go over their airwaves. Uh, certain types of, like you say, swear words or um, seen type speech and then yeah thanks for the comment on pornography you know is that that's a type of speech I think a lot of people would not want to allow or I should say that's a type of that's a pornography is something classified by the government as speech I think there's a debate about whether it is actually speech or not um, the the courts accept it as speech and so that is one that a lot of people would be interested in banning uh, but other thoughts, other types of speech that maybe you would not want to allow in our society or in your daily life or a speech you know of that's banned? If not, that's fine too. We'll we'll go through some of these. Um, but I think if you now, I think that a lot of people, if they went, if they took some time to think through it um, and recognize there's there's constantly a push to silence certain types of speech and conduct, um, whether we're doing it just through our society and our actions or through the law. And it's, it's very common for society to favor certain types of speech and disfavor others. So as an example, this one's real time. Uh, happening right now and the Utah Supreme Court and Utah Bar are worried about the appearance of the legal profession and so they're proposing a new professional rule that um, makes it professional misconduct for an attorney meaning you can be disbarred for it if you say things that um, and they, they connect it to, they say, well, in the scope of a law-related activity. Um, they say, if you say something discriminatory, bigoted, or otherwise harmful to the attorney's client, so to your own client, and this is harmful, this isn't, you can say it to anyone, but if it's harmful to your, to your client, to another attorney's client, or to the administration of justice, you can receive professional misconduct for that and potentially be disbarred. Um, so what are the pros and cons of this type of rule to say we've got to have respect for the law so the legal profession needs to be on the up and up attorneys can't say things that are discriminatory bigoted or otherwise harmful who who decides if it's bigoted or harmful or i assume discriminatory would be governed by the laws of discrimination but who decides on the bigoted and harmful? It's it's a good question. The rule doesn't say, um, which means it's often left to the body tasked with enforcing it, which would be there's a committee, a disciplinary committee in the, in the Utah Bar. Um, and then you can appeal that decision usually to the Utah Supreme Court. And so they would be the ones looking at it, though. But there is no set standard of what is or isn't considered appropriate. I guess I just have a big concern. I don't like it when things are ambiguous like that. When it's so, because there's so much bias. If you just if you don't even have a guideline and it's just left up to whoever's in the ruling body at the time. And I mean, and then you know if it's okay with the current ruling body, then they wait five years. It's a different one, and they go back five years and say, hey, this was harmful, and this guy needs to be disbarred. Kind of like things, yeah, 
I don't, so I don't think that's a good thing. It needs to have more clarity about how that's handled, I guess. Yeah, so the, the lack of clarity is a serious issue. Uh, the rule is really short. Um, it's really not uh, a model of clarity at all, for sure. Um, but other thoughts, pros or cons of this type of rule? I think maybe one question to ask is when it says that you know there's the government essentially it says Congress in the First Amendment that was later expanded into the 14th Amendment to the states as well so when it says that the government shall make no law abridging the freedom of speech um, you know we we look at this and say is it proper even if the government had a super detailed list of what is or isn't appropriate, is it proper for them to say you're an attorney, so therefore you have to abide by this speech code? Because we have this huge interest in ensuring the integrity of the law. So here's... Uh, Doing a couple things real quickly, so forgive me. I'm going to jump back just a little bit. So, one of the things that uh, the Supreme Court is is said that you can't do is say in a crowded theater, fire when there isn't a fire. That is not protected by freedom of speech. So, I think one of the it goes back to the principle of does it what you're saying cause imminent harm? So if you were at a gun range and uh, you were trying to convince someone to shoot somebody else at the gun range, that would be eminent harm, right? Because you have a firearm. Um, you can't just, so now to the attorney situation, the, one of the questions I have for you, Austin, is <clears throat> my understanding is what you said is it's within the bar, so it's not necessarily illegal but within uh, you don't want someone disparaging someone else um, uh, so I can't say when uh, Austin you're almost 10 years younger than me so I can't say that when I was 12 I was molested by Austin Hepworth you know that's disparaging you right um, and so those things have been found that you can that are not protected by free speech. Uh, those are two areas where it's not allowed. But my concern is we've got, it, it sounds like it's going away from disparaging or bearing false witness to this hurts my feelings. And that's where a line is easily crossed, in my opinion. Um, it's happened up in uh, Canada. Canada was trying to, this is what Jordan Peterson is famous for, was uh, Canada was trying to pass a law, uh, or it might even just have been a school, but I believe it wound up that, no, it was, it was law where you had to use the proper pronoun for someone. So if someone was born a biological male and they decided they wanted to be called female, you had to call them female. And uh, well, what happens if that biological male who said he wanted to be a female then because decides he wants to be seen as a dog do you have to refer him to him as a dog do you have to refer to him as a cat or do you and they have the ability to go back and forth how do you keep up with that type of proper pronoun so that's something that i think is coming down the pike and we have to pay attention to because that enters the realm of feelings as opposed to uh, reality and how are we supposed to know and keep up yeah so there's there's certainly a lot um, of issues that you know you highlighted in there um, one is yes this is not technically a law 
in the sense it's not something I go to jail for, but it is something I can lose my law license for. That that they call it a privilege is now taken away uh, if I say something that's considered discriminatory, bigoted, or harmful to another attorney's client. And this doesn't have to be an attorney that I'm working with or in a case against necessarily. This can just be, yeah, you know, I said something and another attorney's client says they're hurt by that. Um, to the point of things like the forced speech where you have to say things, you have to say certain pronouns. Um, that gets into another issue. And so we'll, we'll jump down to that because I think it's, I think it's a really interesting issue uh, to consider. We have a huge, huge push in our society against bullying, which I think is, is really good. We shouldn't be bullying people. Um, so this is a real situation that I watched unfold uh, that I helped with um, defending against, even though we, we lost on this one. Um, but local schools, have adopted very, very serious bullying policies, anti-bullying policies, uh, trying to protect students. And they don't tolerate bullying at all. And so this is, a, again, a situation I think is fascinating to see some of the outgrowth of. Um, and this is, again, going to kind of the forced speech protecting people that you're talking about with the context of using the proper pronoun. So in this situation, we'll just call this person Jim. Uh, he's a janitor at a local school, and he manages other janitors. So he's he's kind of a mid-level management. He has a boss, but he's tasked with managing this crew. He's brought in to this crew specifically because they're they're lazy. They don't like to work. Uh, Jim works hard, and Jim's boss tells him he needs to get this crew working more and needs to get them on their toes. So Jim's doing everything he can to make that happen, uh, but. These people just don't listen. They don't care. They're used to what they're doing. They often will drive out to a school to start working there and sit in their truck for an hour while they're on the clock, you know, different things like that. So uh, Jim's written them up before, um, but they're still not doing anything. And it gets to the point where he tells them, well, if you don't want to work, you can quit. You know, there's the door. Um, go on out. And a couple of times in dealing with them, he did raise his voice a couple of times in frustration because they just would not respond. They would not work. So the employee, one of the employees goes, and I think there was actually two, they filed a complaint with HR and said that Jim was bullying them um, by threatening. And HR agreed with the employees and said that Jim had violated the school's anti-bullying policy and they suspended his employment due to his bullying. And so, uh, what do you think of this situation? Was this result proper here? Uh, and why or why not? <clears throat> well, HR, is that within the school system? I mean, that's yeah, the- Yeah, that's, that's the school's HR system, yep. Okay, well, um, I think, uh, Jim's boss uh, needs needed to talk with Jim about how he could get them to to work more. Uh, you know, there needed to be some instructions to Jim, uh, so he was left sort of high and dry if if he didn't know if he hadn't been uh, trained and how to handle yeah. it uh, and uh it seems silly to say that you know if you're not doing your work then you uh you can't say that they, they need to be fired but uh i guess there needs to be documentation or something like that i don't know yeah it's, it's an interesting result because these employees said to hr we felt intimidated and threatened when he told us we would lose our job. And I'm, I'm sure they did. I'm sure that's, that's a good thing. Yeah. Um, but I guess it, it draws into question then, 
And this is this is part of what you know the response we specifically wrote to the school is I said to them, I said, if you don't let management tell your employees that they can be fired <laughs> for not working, I said you will lose all managerial control of your school. They will figure it out that you can't tell them anything and all they have to do is file a complaint about you. And and it's interesting to look at that situation now. This has unfolded over a few years. Um, this guy is no longer there at the school, but the school is losing people left and right. Um, management can't manage. The employees are kind of taking over the situation and it's becoming, it's not, it's not a pretty situation there. Um, but again, the school's bullying policy is so intense that you know you can't you can't threaten someone, you can't make them feel intimidated. I, I've seen that happen with um, a new principal coming in and taking away the management of, of teachers, saying they can't do certain things to manage their class. You know, uh, yeah. So it it does. Yeah, with the, with the result of a lot of good teachers left the school. Yeah. So this is, I guess, I mean, I've seen this at a lot of the places that I work. Like you, if you want to talk to somebody about losing their job, you basically have to have HR involved, and you have to. It's it's actually. I there was a guy that I worked with that he got fired, and um, he, I I was the one assigned to clean out his office. Um, for after he left and he left all of his papers out and he had basically been in the process it had taken our boss two years to fire him basically the boss had been working with him you know on a performance improvement plan you know meeting with HR and that's how long it took even though the guy the guy's performance never changed the whole time but I mean when my boss did it the right way I mean, not the right way, I guess, that the way that wouldn't get him in trouble, um, you know, that he, it took, it took two years of, of proof and of meetings to be able to have the justification to fire this guy. And at a place like that, yeah, the employees have way too much control. The HR, even the HR people themselves, it was like a merry-go-round at that place. They didn't last very long because <laughs> the employees had so much control over their situation um, of it taking it took a really long time to go discipline anybody and I don't I didn't like that I mean I, I do it's, it's interesting because we're you know we're supposed to be in um, what's it called at will employment or whatever states um, you know where we can be fired we're supposed to be able to understand that we can be fired at any time um, and it's, you know, when your supervisor can't eat, and, but I've seen the other off of this, and when the supervisor's so scared of getting in trouble, he doesn't tell his guys that they're doing a bad job. And then when finally those guys do get fired, it's a surprise to them because they thought they were doing a good job. Um, but management comes in and says, okay, you're done. <laughs> and then they're surprised. So it, it, it doesn't benefit the employees either, though, because eventually it might come back to bite them and they had no idea that they were doing something wrong or unacceptable i guess yeah yeah for sure um those are all good uh, good points um and it is interesting to see where we're at like you say with hr you can't engage in a discussion with an employee that might make them be concerned about their job unless hr is involved um you know, proves that you're not bullying or not whatever, because ultimately what's happening right now is that the law is really gravitating to protect people's feelings. And again, there's, there's actual bullying that's very harmful. Um, and I think it's appropriate for schools, for example, to address bullying issues among students that are there. Um, but there's a level two where we have to figure out how to strike this balance because when we're delving so far into protecting feelings, you know, if 
should an employee fear that they'll lose their job? Yeah, just think about that question. Or should you have a right to never have that fear? Uh, I think the answer is, it's probably decent to have a healthy level of fear about your job if you don't do what you're supposed to do. Now, if you go sit for your truck in, in an hour, for an hour in your truck, then why is it okay to not expect to lose your job and to not live and you'll feel that fear or that trepidation associated with that? And going back to the the attorneys, uh, this is, I, I wrote a response to this rule. They were asking for public comment on it. And one of the things I said is that um, a lot of the, the language of the rule appeared at targeting the same thing, adopting this notion that we need to respect the way that people feel and not, not make them feel heard or challenged. And I just said specifically, I said an attorney's job, when you represent a client, your job is to make the other side feel yeah. as uncomfortable as possible. Yeah. You want to really push them. You want to really push for the truth and find ways to get the truth and show the truth. And the truth is uncomfortable for a lot of people. If you're in an unemployment dispute, for example, like Jim, uh, it's uncomfortable for the other attorney to bring out the times that Jim yelled at them or raised his voice. Um, but it should be uncomfortable for those other employees every time that uh, Jim's attorney brings out the fact, well, you weren't working, you weren't doing your job, you had been talked to. You know, th those are things that, from my perspective, it's the purpose of the law to do, is to put people on, you know, no one likes being in the witness seat. It's not meant to be comfortable. It's not meant to feel good. Um, because you are suddenly kind of having a little judgment day where you're having your actions reviewed by somebody else and it's a, it's a painful experience. Um, now, should attorneys be, you know, spouting off in court about how white supremacy or other things like that? Now, maybe not. Maybe there's, maybe there is some appropriate level to that to say you can't say things like that. Um, but a lot of this rule was catching this feeling related push that's, that's occurring. And John brought that up with the example from Canada. And Canada has gone pretty far and they, they've actually forcibly closed all religious law schools, religious based law schools in Canada, because they said that there's a high risk that attorneys will come out um, brainwashed essentially into believing that people shouldn't have constitutional rights to be um, gay. So I said, because of the, the harm, the potential for that, they don't feel that religious-based institutions can produce attorneys that comply with Canada's constitution's high standards. And they, they've shut those down. They're starting to push attorneys out who advocate or represent people who are being prosecuted for saying things. For example, in Canada, you can be prosecuted for preaching that um, homosexuality is a sin because it, it makes someone feel bad. And, and these types of, this type of law is really getting into a fascinating place. Um, from my perspective, one of the things it does is that it gives the person, they realize it's kind of like the kids, if, if I have a child and they're in the store and they throw a tantrum and I give them candy that they're asking for, they'll realize that Ooh, I can control mom and dad by wanting to have them calm down. And people are pretty smart. And they start to realize that, well, all I have to do is take offense. And if I take offense, then the law gives me what I want. It silences someone else. Um, and we start to shift. There starts to become the shift of power to those that take offense or are willing to take offense. I'm not targeting any specific person. I'm saying any, any single person can do that. I see people on all sides all the time saying, well, that offends me. And I think we're saying that quite often because the law is adopting this notion that, yeah, we need to protect against offending someone. John, were you jumping in there? I am just taking myself off mute. What was the question to me? Oh no, I just I just heard something and it sounded like you jumping in for a second. So I was just asking if you were. No, that wasn't me jumping in, at least I hope not, accidentally. Um, but how about this? So since I'm on, I'll, I'll double down. So the, the concern is so one of the concerns that I have with people using proper pronouns what 
is supposedly in a way absurd right now, but it's not too far off. And actually, there is even talk about this. Say like a, you got a seven or eight year old that wants, or a five year old that wants to identify themselves as uh, the opposite sex. And then the next day they want to identify themselves as a fish or a, um, a race car or something like that. The, the, the concern is how do I, one, one thing is, is how does the public keep up with what you want to be approached as? And without me even knowing or interacting with you, I see you, I perceive this. Uh, I'm, I'm a white Caucasian. What if today I want to be, you know, I, I, I self-identify as a uh, um, indigenous person to the United States, you know, a, a Native American. Well, what if three weeks from now I identify myself as a short Asian man? Uh, they're, they're, and then I, people are legally required to interact with me that way. Um, that becomes an un, at least an unfair burden. Yeah, and that, that certainly does. Um, and again, even going to, if you take that perspective a little bit deeper, what's happening is that the law is saying you need to respect their feelings, you know, the way that they feel inside. And the law is saying, you know, we've, we've come to the place where we recognize how important feelings are and, and all these things. But your point is, but how do I know what someone will feel? And it's the same, Alan raised this um, and asking this question. He says, well, who decides what's discriminatory, bigoted, or harmful? Is how do I know what somebody else will feel inside when I say something? How do I know if I've offended someone or not? And to put that burden on me, uh, what it does is it produces fear inside of us and causes us to interact less because we we sense that burden that, oh, I can't say anything that might offend them um, or that might appear discriminatory or bigoted. And as Alan raised too, well, what if in five years they come back and you know we've we've progressed even further as a society or society's changed and they say, oh, well, that wasn't an appropriate thing to say five you now. And so now there's going to be issues for that. How can we, as a individual, even comply with that type of standard? And I think that's what you're getting at, John, is to say, that's a huge burden to place on me to know um, all these things, to know how someone feels inside, and to to live up to that level of compliance. Um, but if we go back to the First Amendment, this says. You know, essentially, the government or Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of speech. Then we have this place and we say, yeah, you know, maybe it's a laudable goal to protect feelings. Maybe it's a laudable goal to help people feel included. But then it gets into the question of but how do we do that in light of what we have? And is the freedom of speech here proper to maintain? Or are we getting to a place where society is saying, I don't like the freedom of speech anymore because we need to protect feelings more. And so this to me is, is an issue that is quickly coming up in our society. So and I want to say, yeah, I wanted to say, the um, thing I don't like about this, even, even, I know that like discrimination is protected by federal law, and I think that's a good thing um, for you know different things. But even if somebody just makes one statement um, that's even discriminatory, you know, we're not even talking about you know somebody's feelings, but it is a discriminatory statement. If they just say it once, and we get them in trouble, um, and you know take away their license, or just you know, and it, you can see it, you know, in the media, if somebody says something once, and then some say a famous person does it, and they they're just destroyed on media you know for that and it, it eliminates the chance for education um, you know obviously if somebody is preaching something discriminatory over and over and over again that's different but if we if we make all these harsh laws um, that are allowing us to get offended at, at one statement we can't ever we can't ever educate each other um, to figure out 
how to how to be dear to other people and how to be nice and how they feel um, if they just get mad and run away to the courts. Uh, the government is too involved, I think, at that point. And we need to learn as a people how to talk to each other and tell them, hey, that hurt. Can you stop doing that? And at least give them a chance to do that. Um, I did a training like eight years ago at a place, and that was – the whole the whole thing that they it was a just you know HR discriminatory discrimination training and there was no they didn't set forth any code of conduct for the company they just said don't do anything that would be offensive to somebody else well you don't know if it's going to be offensive until you do it um, and but then getting them in trouble right away won't educate them it'll just make them mad so that's what I worry they're just we're not allowing ourselves to progress and learn from others if we immediately get mad, report people, and put um, consequences into effect. Yeah, and those are, those are also really good points. Um, the Founding Fathers, when asked what they felt the solution was to bad speech or you know, discriminatory things or bigoted things, they said consistently the answer is more speech. And at least what I see you talking about there is that, yeah, you need the chance to, rather than say, hey, go punish that guy and you know, let me never see him again. It should be, let's promote this discussion. Let's promote an understanding of what is or isn't proper conduct as a society. You know, why we would say things, why we wouldn't. And will it take more time to change people? Yeah, it takes time for sure. But it places a, a burden on each of us if, there is bad speech out there for us to go and use more speech to change that. And the Founding Fathers believe strongly in the principle of additional speech to remedy situations. Um, and that sounds to me like you know, part of what you were talking about there is we've got to get away from the harsh punishment. Because again, one of the things that the harsh punishment does is if I'm sitting here and I need to say something, um, to someone, let's say that I'm an attorney. This is a real situation right now. I was actually contacted over this situation. Um, a dad was married, had a child with his wife. Um, you know, they were married in their religion together. They both believed the same things, followed the same things. But something happened at some point where the wife changed quite a bit, and she eventually divorced him and started living with a transgender person. Um, I don't, I don't know exactly whether. And what they started out as or what they were right now um but when the son they had one son together and the young son when the young son would go for visitation to the mom uh, they would dress him as a girl and the dad was just up in arms about this um you know he felt very strongly that was wrong and shouldn't be happening and so he was in court uh, he was an attorney actually and he was representing himself and he would go and um, you know, push really hard, fight really hard to not have his child dressed as a girl. And the court sanctioned him over it, um, saying that he was discriminatory and, and improper and things. Um, and eventually he had to get uh, attorneys to come in. The court ordered him to hire an attorney himself and you know, be more civil and things. Um, but in that situation, if I'm if I'm coming in as an attorney under this rule, can I even represent my client in that situation? Can I go make arguments to the court that the son shouldn't be dressed as a girl by the the ex-wife who's now chosen a different path in life? <clears throat> or would that be considered discriminatory, bigoted, and harmful uh, to this other attorney's client? And I get disbarred for that. And if that's the case, if someone's in that situation, then they're now without representation because that attorney is going to be afraid to make that argument you're going to say well i can't i can't say that because i might you know that might come back to bite me and i might lose my license at some point point." and so rules like this to alan's point when they're when they're very harsh and uh, you offend once and can be done it uh it puts a chilling effect on speech it's what the Supreme Court calls it. There's a chilling effect where we're, we're now afraid to say something. And historically, before this time, the court's been very adverse to a chilling effect. They say if a law has a chilling effect because you don't know what it does or doesn't regulate, 
they say we we strike it down and they they've again they've they've lived that way for 200 plus years but now we have the Utah Supreme Court coming out and these rules being proposed that are not precise at all in what they're talking about what they're circumscribing um and it's fascinating to me to see the shift in the courts that's happening the courts are very much shifting to a system where they're tolerating far more of a chilling effect on speech um and they're they're okay with that and i think one of the reasons they're they're okay with that chilling effect right now is because they're adopting this notion that we need to be more protective of people's feelings and you know things that harm their emotional or mental state but it's taking us into some very uncharted waters and really changing a lot with the constitution as we as we pursue that um but we'll we'll look at it in a couple different veins too we'll, we'll go on here um i don't know if any of you are familiar with lumosity it's a it's a website that worked really hard to gain a really big audience they had millions and millions um i think they potentially had over 100 million people around the world on their platform people really enjoyed the games they had their brain games brain puzzles and things like that and they would advertise that their games would help increase cognitive functioning slow memory loss and overall improve the brain the federal government eventually saw these ads and said hey you don't have any study to back up your claims. And so we're going to come after you for violating consumer protection laws because you can't make a claim, the FTC says, that's not backed by a study. And they, they went after Lumosity. Uh, they actually, I think, when they started the case, the FTC has the power to freeze a business and its assets at the beginning of the case. And from what I know, they did that to Lumosity. They, they sought to freeze their assets at the beginning. Um, because they said, you don't have a study, you can't make these claims. And so um, in this situation, there was no study. Lumosity didn't have a study, you know, a scientific study. And so what, what should happen in this scenario? Um, you know, under the Constitution, under the First Amendment, should a business be required to have a study for making these types of claims? Should they be allowed to make these types of claims without a study? Um, what are your thoughts on that? <clears throat> Would you um, <clears throat> say that someone, a business should be able to make claims about something as long as there aren't studies to the opposite? I mean, what um, I would think that, you know, in advertising, you'd have to say what's true, but I don't know what, how you find that out. I mean, can you say anything unless there's something that shows that it's absolutely wrong? Um. So that certainly used to be the case um, that you could say anything. The government's come super far on that and advertising has been severely, severely restricted um, and chipped away at over time. Uh, but this, this goes down to, I think, one of the core principles that we're discussing today still of the law and the government is looking to protect us from they would say it's bad speech they don't want a company selling us anything unless it's absolutely proven to do that they're going oh lumosity you have people signing up hoping it will improve their brain and what if it doesn't then they just wasted their money and so we've got to protect people from that potential of wasting their money kind of like the government wants to protect from Heart, hurt feelings or you know other situations um and so yes you know to say what should happen let's say that there was a study that came out and said no brain games don't do anything for improving your brain um what's one of the problems even with that of banning lumosity from claiming that their brain games improve the brain well one, one of the problems i have um is that this supposed care or justice is very selective. So like Nintendo, for their DS, they had Brain Age, I bought it. And uh, they use uh, 
is Ryuta Kawashima. Anyway, apparently he did studies, and apparently uh, you can, you know, make the brain stronger by doing certain exercises and stuff. So why does Lumosity get the hammer thrown down on him when there are many other companies that are not touched? You know, uh, it's it's the selective justice of uh, um, hurting one company or one person, but letting another person, you know, alone. It's also very disturbing. Yeah, and that is a that is a real issue because one of the main questions I get asked as an attorney was the chance that I'm the one that gets this enforced against them. <laughs> um, everyone in America knows that there's nothing that's enforced against everybody. And so people, when they talk to attorneys, the question is always, what's the chance the government comes after me? What are my odds on this? Um, and it's a really, a really uh, bad place, in my opinion, to be. Because if we're if we're gambling on our our chance, well, are we the Lumosity or the Nintendo of the world? It does start to produce a lot of interesting issues. Um, if you follow the John Swallow debate, debacle in Utah that happened, he was the Attorney General. Um, he got kicked out of being the Attorney General because a guy made a claim that you could pay him um, to not have the government enforce things against you. And the guy specifically said that I think he'd paid him three hundred thousand dollars or something to not have uh, to not be prosecuted. And the government went through and investigated, and they've they eventually said they didn't feel there was any wrongdoing on what happened. And the guy that made the claim against Jeremy against um, John Swallow went to jail. Um, he was the, the government came down pretty hard on him and sent him to jail. Um, but it is an, a really interesting issue um, on the selective prosecution for sure, because one of the things that's happening, and I actually, I heard this expressly said, that they said the, the, the liberal um, rights, and this was a person that was very liberal, and they said the liberal rights require so much police to enforce that there's no way to um, have enough agents, have enough government agents to enforce it all. So I said, the only way to enforce it is to make every citizen a policeman, essentially, where they can all file a complaint or seek remedies against the company themselves when they violate a law. So we see that happening quite a bit in America, where individuals are given what they call a private right of action, where if there's a law passed, the individual can sue, they can recover attorney's fees, they can get damages uh -huh. for situations where a company breaks a law. More and more the government is turning to that to try and enforce the law. And that comes up with its own can of worms, for sure. Um, but in this in this situation, looking at the speech issue here, Lumosity, you know, from my perspective, as far as I can tell, Lumosity really believes in its its games and their ability to, to, to do these things. And do we want to be at the point in society where every company has to have, you know, what, what do we want? One scientific study, three scientific studies, five, 10. How many do they need before they can start advertising to say how cool their product is or how much fun it is? One, I have a couple things I want to say. The first thing is, is I've um, had some health problems and I've had a lot of doctors give me something and say, this is going to fix you. And it doesn't. And so then, like, how far are we gonna let this let this go? I mean, obviously, I'm fine with that. I don't. I mean, the doctors, we have a finite understanding of the human body. I'm fine that they gotta, um, you know, just kind of test some things sometimes because they don't really, you know, they don't have enough of an understanding. That's great, but I mean, that's to me, that's going down this road if we really strictly enforce something like that. Um, the other, I mean. People make claims all the time. It's up to us, I think, more so to figure out what's right or what's wrong. The other thing that disturbs me about this, though, is, is that it doesn't seem to be working in the opposite direction. Um, there are plenty of studies out there that document the harm that pornography causes, but we don't do anything against pornography. The government doesn't. Um, and then there are, there are 
I, I used to work um, for Monsanto, the maker of Roundup. They've been bought by Bayer, but Bayer now, um, despite the fact that the EPA has done their studies and they have found no evidence that Roundup contains carcinogens, Bayer has to has been forced because the courts um, keep ruling in favor of people who say that it does, despite a lack of studies that show that. Um, Bayer is now having to pay ten billion dollars um, to settle these cases out of court. Um, so it doesn't. So I don't. I don't like it when things don't work equally the same direction <laughs> in in opposite directions. Um, even when there are studies showing harm. The government's not doing anything about it, or in this case, for Bayer, there are no studies that say that it is a carcinogen. Um, there, there's one agency, one of the four agencies in the UN that classifies carcinogens. I said it's a possible one, but the other three say that it's not. The Roundup's not. The EPA says Roundup's not, but we still, Bayer is still basically being forced to say. Okay, it might have caused harm. We're going to pay all this money now um, to solve the problem. So I'd like to see that applied both directions if we're going to apply it at all. And I think you know it's a good point to talk about how it's how the same thing's not happening. But one of the the biggest problems, and I as an attorney, I have almost zero faith in a study. Um, if you're ever in a lawsuit over this kind of stuff, what happens in court? is that there's an expert that comes in and testifies for one side and an expert that comes in and testifies for the other side. Both are experts, both are recognized by the world as experts and both say polar opposite things. Um, they can come up with studies that show polar opposite things. Um, they can come up with you know, debates about all these things. Um, and even on a study, <laughs> there is one that I'm, I'm assuming this was made up. Uh, it's one of the made up statistics out there, but I think it highlights a good point. And they said, yeah, we've determined that um, within five years, 70% of studies are found to be wrong for some reason. Um, because one of the things about a study is that you have to control for all kinds of variables to have them be truly effective. And if you miss one of those variables and you didn't realize it was an issue or you just didn't have the money to test it or you didn't have the way to control it at the time or whatnot, it can radically change the, the results of a study. And I remember even in when I was in University of Utah in my statistics class, we had to do a study of people. And we had to, they wanted us to keep doing studies until we found something that um, had a certain causation or correlation rate to it. And I remember I did my first study. It was a lot of work to get you know enough people to respond and things. And it didn't have the correlation that, that I needed for the class. And so what I did is I just started experimenting about which factors I could drop out. Um, and eventually found if I dropped two of the questions out of what I studied, I'd have the correlation necessary. And so I just dropped those two out of the study and submitted that and you know got my got my grade and things. Um, but I've, I've played with studies, I've done that. In court, attorneys play with them all the time, uh, experts play with them, and every lawsuit in court over this kind of stuff has experts on both sides. And I look at that and I say, well, if there's people that can swear up and down that it's one way or another way, that it does help, that it doesn't help, who is it, going back to that original question we we're asking with the attorneys, who is it that gets to decide that? And why? And again, going back to the founding fathers, they said, if you start giving people the power to make these decisions about what's true and what's not true, um, they said that's a to them that was a very dangerous place to be that led to a, a bad result. And they really wanted the response to speech to be more speech. Um, you know, for these companies, if a company's making a claim that it does things and it's not, then maybe the government can put out studies and say, hey, we've you know, we found this or we found that, or uh, maybe other companies can do that that are competitors or things. Um, maybe individuals can search themselves and say, well, is it really helping me? Do I care if it's helping me because I enjoy the game? Um, you know, I think all of us know at some point inside that when we buy a new product and it says, you know, best product on earth and it breaks in three weeks, well, 
yeah, we only paid 20 bucks for it and we, we kind of move on. We, we take those risks all the time. But as we allow the government to come into this space more and more and start making more and more calls about what's true or isn't true, uh, we get into a fascinating place because in this situation, Lumosity, what eventually happened is, as part of their settlement, they went out and got a study that supported their claims. And so now they're back, they're advertising again, they're doing things again. They say things a little differently now, but they now have a study. But again, I look at it and say, well, I could go out and make a study that backs the claims. You know, just go experiment with the variables until we find what works or what doesn't work. And have we really changed anything? Have we really protected anyone at that point? Or have we only made it more difficult for people to do business and made it so that we're pushing the power of business into the hands of bigger and bigger entities that can pay for those studies? Um, in the alternative health world, I'm working right now on a project to promote alternative health. And one of its biggest problems is people say, well, you don't have a study to prove it. But there's also not big money in alternative health because you can't patent a lot of the things that are used. And so big companies aren't interested in it because they can't have a, a corner on the market with it. Um, and so there's there's not the money there to put into things. And alternative health stays there. It does some incredible things for some people. You know, there's other people like Alan that, that try doctors, try alternative health, whatever, things don't necessarily improve. Um, but that's a, you know, it's it's an area where are we lacking now in progression because we've we've seeded this over and said, okay, well, it's got to be true before you start marketing it. Well, what happened to the American experiment? You know, the American dream of progressing, improving, trying. Um, so in a situation like this, I'd be supportive, for example, of a disclaimer that says, hey, we make these claims, but we don't have a study to back it up. So purchase at your own risk. Um, I don't, I don't mind the government necessarily requiring a disclosure like that, um, but to say that you can't advertise at all because you don't have a study, I get very concerned about that because um, that, that will creep into all kinds of areas of our life. Uh, we all make claims every day about things, and I tell people all the time, hey, you should go to this store. Or you should use this guy. Well, maybe it was good for me, but it might not be good for them, and I don't have a study to prove that necessarily. So again, in, in the speech realm, even though it is important um, to protect people and help people, I think it's important for us to recognize that we need to maintain the responsibility to make decisions for ourselves and not expect the government to protect us from all these situations. It ultimately pushes, it ultimately really makes it difficult for a small business owner to exist and pushes a lot of power into the hands of corporations to um, to make these calls and, and these judgments as well as to the government. Um, we won't have time to finish up on these. Uh, this is one about gas tax ads. There's a lot of regulation on political speech. So it's just kind of something to keep in your mind that if you're gonna run an ad on a political topic, um, there are forms you have to file. There's compliance, you know, reporting, um, financial disclosures to follow with it. And it's interesting because we go from this situation where you're in all kinds of trouble for not having a study to this situation where there's gas tax and they're running ads that, oh, this will benefit Utah schools. You know, this will improve the mental health of students. This will lead to better education results. You can say whatever you want in politics. You don't need a study for any of it. And and we go to the polls and vote based on what these people are saying. And again, politicians in America, the, the courts have said, yeah, we can't, we can't stop a politician for saying anything fraudulent. Politicians are allowed to say whatever they want and it's up to the people to figure it out. Because they said that would violate the First Amendment. And so the courts have said, yep, we can't do anything about a lie or a lack of a study or anything in politics, but we're gonna step in and Know, govern with a very strong force at this point um, when it comes to advertising. And I look at it and go, well, what's the bigger harm here? I spent 20 bucks on brain games or I voted for a gas tax that's going to be permanent now for you know, the foreseeable future in Utah. Um, and why don't we demand truth in politics? Why do we 
Again, the courts have said we can't demand truth in politics because that would just run so far afoul of the First Amendment. Um, and so we have a funny situation in America where politicians can lie all they want, but an uh, honest business owner can't make a claim when he doesn't have a study to back it up. Um, so to Alan's point too, it's not being applied equally. Um, we also get into the issue, you know, another societal issue of fake news. And um, what should happen with that? There's a huge push right now to silence and censor all fake news. And on this point, again, it goes back to, well, who decides what's fake or what's true? Because Facebook classified an abortion, or uh, yeah, someone opposed to abortion, a pro-life group, they would make the statement that abortion is murder. And they were classified as fake news by Facebook for that. Facebook said that's not true. And that, that issue of whether or not it's murder is a deeply personal issue. Um, I don't think it's something that we can scientifically or theologically prove necessarily, because even religions differ a fair amount on whether that is or isn't murder. Um, but Facebook's decided that's, that's fake news. So I, I bring these up just to highlight the issues that we're looking at. And again, drilling down into where do we fall on this? And are we going to push for more censorship, more regulation of speech, or are we going to go back to a place and say, no, this, this needs to work itself out through more speech. We need to allow people to speak, you know, speak and have the freedom to speak. Recognizing that yes, there'll be some harm. Um, either situation brings some harm, but what situation brings us the best scenario? Um, this is another example. Governments have fought aggressively to control coronavirus news. Countries all around the world have mandated that, that local news not report on it and that you only go to the official source. And so currently the White House has also asked the coronavirus info go there and bypass the CDC on that. Um, you know, these are these are things that, yeah, can it be good to have a place to go for actual facts? Well, yes. But then it begs the question, but can you trust that official source? Or do they have reasons that they want to make that the official source? And how do we have a check on the official source at that point to make sure it is truly the official source? And again, this is a lawsuit question to me because attorneys are always challenging things. It's one of their jobs to say, well, is that really official or not? And dig in and find out ways it's been manipulated or messed with or tainted along the way. And so, again, the founding fathers wanted that to be a an open thing where anyone could dig into that, challenge that, present their case, argue it. Um, but our world's quickly, quickly pushing to change from that type of environment. So I hope that with this, uh, we're able to think some about speech in your own life and what types of speech you'll be willing to tolerate, even if it causes some harm today. Um, you know, or to say, no, this is what I believe, this is where we need to go. Because a lot of this unfolds, the ways that a lot of this ends up is simply the what society does as they go along with it. If you accept it and don't say anything about it, the law will ultimately embrace it. And so if you, if you see things that are happening that are bad, it becomes incumbent on us so that to stop the law from embracing it at some point, to speak up and say something about it today show that you're not okay with it. Um, you don't like what you know, the government did or a company did or an individual did and really work to, to raise your voice on that. Because um, again, the law will ultimately, judges will ultimately look and say, well, everyone else demands this, so we'll, we'll give it to them. That's what every judge thinks. Um, they, the thought at least crosses their mind, but a lot of times they're really, really um, pushed by that. I clerked for a few judges and they had always asked two things. What will everyone else think? And will I be overturned on a pill or not? And that was, you know, they'd always ask those questions. So you have a lot of power to help in navigating where this goes as a society, um, but you have to speak up to exercise that power. And we currently have that freedom to still speak up. And so I'd highly encourage you to do that. Uh, but are there any remaining questions or thoughts before we uh, finish the call today?
I think, um, <clears throat> excuse me, with uh, the new more heightened awareness with uh, Black Lives Matter, that's um, also a place we need to go and investigate and speak up because it has been that Blacks are more harshly punished for, this, for something that whites are less harshly punished. So I think that is a, um, a, also a thing where freedom is important. And uh, we, we need to not just say, well, I don't know anybody. <laughs> we need to try to uh, know people and find out more about it and speak up. Yeah, and on, on that, um, yeah, so I agree. When we see things that are wrong, um, the one of the things I hope that everyone takes away is that the the constitutional system is based in following. Essentially, it follows who speaks. And if we don't speak, there can be issues. Um, there's a whole flip side of issues, speech issues in the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, that we won't have time to go into today that we'll probably address in a future discussion um because there's there's definitely some truths to the movement um but there's very serious concerns for legal precedent as well about some of the things that they're pushing for and asking for as a as a remedy or a solution to the problem that's happened before um and so i think it's important to be aware but again we'll 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 delve into that later um but for now the point is you know, very well taken that if there is a problem, it's incumbent on us to raise our voices about it. And I think that's a moral responsibility that comes to us to speak up and say something because that's the, that's the system. That's what this freedom of speech is, is it gives us the power to influence where society goes, where laws go. And that voice is an incredibly powerful kind of rudder that sets that course for the future. Um, and the more we speak up and discuss things, um, the more powerful we can, the more powerful we can be in helping to control that that course to a good place. You know, we certainly want to overcome our issues of the past, but in doing so, we also don't want to take on a whole new set of issues that we don't need to. And I, I think that there's ways to balance both. Um, so, but yeah, that I think that'll be a topic for another discussion for sure to delve into some of the the pros and cons of uh, Black Lives Matter and other movements like that right now, um, so that we can at least be aware of issues and decide where we fall on those issues of how we want to address those things. Um, so thanks for your time. Sorry, go ahead, John. Something I would say is I want to err on freedom because what can be what you can use against someone else can be used against you, uh, and I would say that that's what we need to. Uh, allow for is yes we don't want to hurt others but eventually usually the mirror image winds up happening so that's something i would keep in mind when we try to decide whether something can be used in speech or not so that would be my last comment yeah i think the golden rule is a very applicable one on some people will say well that means they shouldn't be allowed to say that because i would never say that to someone um, but on the flip side, we need to say, well, do you want to be sent to jail or lose your license or be shut down as a business because you said something inappropriate that someone else felt was inappropriate? And so we have to look at both sides of that coin to say, what what do we tolerate and, and what don't we? But founding fathers definitely erred on the side of freedom. Um, they were very, very strong to freedom. And their statement was simply, Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of speech. Um, and again, we've, we've come pretty far from that. There's quite a few laws, even in the political context, there's, I don't know, tens of thousands of pages of regulations on political speech, but there's not one that requires it to be truthful. <laughs> um, so it's, it's a funny situation. We have a lot at play, but a lot that's in our hands to really help, um, dictate the way that goes. So. Thanks for joining us today. We'll we'll touch base next week. And again, let me know if you have things you'd like to discuss as well, so that we can do that. Thanks for your time. Thanks, everybody.
Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Austin. Thanks, everybody, and Austin.